Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the next in Naxos's ongoing release of the orchestral works of Florence Price, the newly rediscovered African-American lady composer who has really, really burst upon the scene as part of the classical music world's effort to reclaim its lost legacy. And frankly, I think that's a good effort. It's a worthy effort, especially when it turns up fascinating personalities like Florence Price, who was a real talent. I mean, she was the real deal. And, you know, a, a, a tragic, a tragic life in the sense that that she had almost no opportunities to hear her music performed. And orchestral music in particular, the fact that it's as good as it is and sounds as good as it does, is kind of remarkable. I mean, because she couldn't have had that much experience of it. She had some limited experience, granted. But she wrote a, a series of orchestral works. I mean, there's more than a dozen of them. And they're really fascinating. They have, they have their own perfectly individual character. And for that reason, they deserve to be discovered. They deserve to be played. Now, this disc is particularly interesting because it doesn't get into the symphony conundrum. The symphony conundrum being is, well, was she really a symphonist? Could she handle symphonic form? And the answer was, yes, she could. But it's always going to be controversial. And I, I, there's no need to go into it because these pieces are all different. And what you get, let me, let me read from the back of the, the thingy here. First of all, this is with the Württembergische Philharmonia Reutlingen, one of those very decent German provincial orchestras. They're okay. They sound here under John Jeter, who's been promoting all of this stuff, William Grant Still and, 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 and Florence Price and other African-American composers. They do sound a little tentative here and there. They do. The trumpet could swing a little more. I mean, you know. But they, they get the job done. They get the job done nobly and, and respectably. And the music itself is really, really cool. So first we have two concert overtures. Both of them are based on spirituals. Um, the first is based on Please Don't Let, let This Harvest Pass and Sinner. Um, and boy, oh boy, or is it Sinner, Please Don't Let This Harvest Pass. In any case, it's a very solemn piece. It's not what you usually think is an overture. It's a, a, a spiritual sort of potpourri um, in mostly slow tempo with only a few climaxes. It's very reflective. So, you know, don't get your hopes up for some sort of, you know, rousing Gershwin-esque type thing. It isn't that. It's, it's very, very sensitive and I think somewhat inwardly looking, but quite beautiful. The second is a little bit more rousing. It's based on a couple wonderful spirituals. It's Go Down Moses or Let My People Go. You know that one. Go down Moses, way down to Egypt land. Tell old Pharaoh, oh, oh my, let my people go. God, I love that. I mean, I sang all these, you know, when I was in, in my high school glee club and concert choirs and college and whatnot. You know, you do these things and they're beautiful. They're so beautiful. Wonderful. And every time I feel the spirit, every time I feel the spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Oh, gosh, it's great. It's really up tempo. And so you've got this contrast between it's almost like one of Dvorak's dumkas. You know, a sort of slow lament followed by a, a almost disconcertingly up-tempo business. If you think of the Dvorak Dumki Trio and you think of this overture, you'll know exactly what you're in for. It's a big work, by the way, 13 minutes. And uh, there's also Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen is also in here. And these are, because the tunes are so beautiful, you know, they're, they're not formally all that interesting. They're potpourri overtures where the tunes are just arranged to make an effective scheme of contrasts. And they're lovely. But then comes sort of the meat of the whole program. Two tone poems. They're both called The Oak. One is called The Song of the Oak. And the other is just called The Oak. And exactly what The Oak represented for, for Ms. Price is impossible to tell. I mean, there's something about, you know, uh, permanence, nature, God, religion, nobility, spirituality. It's so evident in these works. The first piece is a big, big tone poem. It's, well, it's 16 minutes long. The Song of the Oak. Now, the Song of the Oak itself, the tune which represents the oak, I think, I mean, sort of, it's hard, not hard to miss it, 
is, is, is a chorale, a church hymn, an extremely beautiful, solemn piece of, of spiritual music, and it's surrounded by, by nature music. And the nature music is extraordinary. I mean, it's not, if you think that Florence Price only writes music that sounds kind of like, you know, Gershwin and those people, you know, the sort of African-American jazz influenced, you know what, this is completely different. This is fascinating, evocative, chromatic, um, textural music. It sounds like, well, any, anybody, it sounds like Arnold Bax. It sounds like November Woods or the creepier parts of Sibelius's Tapiola. And it's really based it's from around the same period, within a decade or two, either way. So it's a remarkable piece that has all kinds. It has got bird song, beautiful writing for the winds, doing bird things, and string tremoli, and 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 and, and nature eruptions and storms, and oh my goodness, it's it's just a whole world of music. It's fantastic, surrounded by this this chorale thing. And at the very end, you hear the chorale fading out gradually with the sound of church bells in the distance. It's incredibly poetic and beautiful. Just a marvelous work. Now, the other piece called just The Oak is, is livelier. It's more eruptive. It has some tremendous dissonant climaxes and a very shocking, tragic, and abrupt ending. There's something very deep and disturbing happening in this tone poem. It's only about 10 minutes long, and it's completely different from the other one. They both begin similarly. They both begin with this sort of threnody on the lower strings, but after that, they go their own way. And for a long time, people thought there was only like one piece called The Oak with slightly different names, but no, they're two completely different works and, and extraordinary works. And then the program concludes with uh, the colonial dance, a four minute, it is absolutely a Dvorak Slavonic dance for in, 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 in African-American garb. And then finally, her, her three dances, the suite of dances, tiny little works, three minutes and 55 seconds for three dances. And they're adorable. They're just adorable, you know, ethno-musical gems is what they are. So these performances, as I said, have a couple moments of tentativeness, but they're generally very, very good. The sonics are perfectly fine, and the music is, is worth discovering. I mean, you know, Price is a serious composer, and she deserves to be played. I think the Song of the Oak would be a knockout piece on any concert program. I really, really do. I mean, in the overtures, for those of us who you know, know, know our spirituals, and even those who don't, I mean, the tunes are amazing and the, and the arrangements are lovely. This is really beautiful music, and it belongs in your collection. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.